Hi, everyone. Um, well, I'm happy to say uh, welcome to the last day of this semester's class. Um, but I'm sad to say that the reason why I'm saying that is we have attempted to get two great speakers for the last class next week. Uh, Matt Kaspari at Aurora Biofuels, great little startup company, so raised about $30 million here at Berkeley. Unfortunately, he gave his call, said he has to be in Seattle. I have no idea re why, but uh, unfortunately he does. And our attempt to get um, John Woolard, who is the CEO of Bright Source Energy, also unfortunately fell through uh, this week. So we are left without a speaker. So I just wanted to say it's been a great semester. I think you guys have seen a tremendous number of entrepreneurs, great number of situations. I hope you're all inspired, and I'm sure Mitch is going to come up here and give you more inspiration uh, about being an entrepreneur and how successful he's been in his lifestyle, uh, in his life and his current lifestyle. So uh, thank you all, and uh, look forward to seeing you around campus. Cheers. Hi, everybody. I just want to go over a few logistical things real quickly. Um, first of all, as you said, as he said, today's the last class. Um, we're having food catered afterwards for everybody. So I hope that you can stick around and uh, mingle, get to speak to Mitch. Additionally, everyone should have received an email regarding the written assignment for this class. And if you have any questions about that, let me know. It's only for the undergraduate students, the MBA students don't have to worry about it. And that's due by the end of the week. Next, if you have any questions about your attendance, you can get in touch with me, but otherwise, uh, if, if there is a problem, we'll contact you by the end of next week. So you don't have to um, inquire regarding that. We'll let you know if there's a problem going on. And last, uh, <clears throat> I hope that you'll continue to take some more CET classes. I'm actually graduating this semester, so I will not be helping out um, with this course anymore. But it's been a pleasure, and I hope that you've really enjoyed this class and found it to be interesting. So thanks a lot, and I'll see you around. Thanks. Okay, and now on to today's speaker. Um, the last speaker in this semester, um, A. Richard Newton um, lecture series. And we're very honored to have Mitch Kapoor here. Mitch is not only the founding chairman of the Mozilla Foundation, and all of you know Mozilla is the maker of the Firefox browser that um, many of us, um, if not all, are using. Um, but really, his, uh, he is a, an icon in the world's software um, industry as the founder and uh, CEO of Lotus Corporation and he personally is the designer of Lotus 1 to 3, the first massively successful spreadsheet in the um, really the killer application of the PC. So Mitch, thank you very much for being here today. Over to you. So let's see. Great. All right. Got the audio. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm, I'm happy to be here today. Um, and let me dive right in. So I don't think we usually think of political campaigns um, uh, as startups, much less as uh, uh, something in which there's a lot of innovation. But uh, having just been through uh, significant involvement with the Obama campaign, I can tell you it is a, a startup, or it was a startup of a very unusual kind. And what was unusual about it was not the starting, but the ending, because it ramped up from nothing to be a $500 million operation with several thousand employees and several million volunteers, and uh, even more quickly uh, ramped down. Uh, but uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a very interesting experience to be involved with the information technology side of uh, of the campaign, and uh, what I wanted to do was to uh, share that with you today. So, um, a few themes that I want to uh, cover. Um, for the first time, oh, and before I do this, actually, let me ask a couple of questions. How many people here were eligible to vote in the last, uh, last election? Okay. Uh, how many of you did any kind of volunteering online or offline as, uh, as part of it, organizing? Just a few. How many people have already started your own business? How, few. How many people uh, have a serious interest in starting a business? Entrepreneurs. OK, great. Thank you. Just help me get calibrated a little bit about uh, who's here. Um, 2008, I think, was the first time the internet really dramatically influenced the outcome of a national political 
uh, campaign. I don't think that's a particularly uh, contentious uh, statement. Um, but the ways in which that worked, I think, are not yet uh, well understood. And in fact, there was a, an array of different kinds of IT that were used to drive the campaign uh, to do some old things in new ways and to do some new things that had never been done before. Uh, and I want to tell you about those. Uh, and then I think uh, we want to take a quick look forward because there's enough evidence available to suggest that information technology is going to be uh, important as a tool actually in governing in some new ways of uh, opening up uh, the US government, uh, uh, in increasing uh, civic engagement, and really trying to push, uh, uh, you know, push the envelope uh, in those uh, dimensions, not IT for its own sake, but information technology in service of the kinds of uh, bigger ideals uh, that uh, President-elect uh, Obama uh, campaigned on. Um, I've been a, a technology entrepreneur now for 30 years, uh, a frighteningly uh, long time, and have uh, started a few companies, have been an angel investor, and have backed um, uh, many, many companies. And my favorite ones are the ones that are not only uh, great companies, great technology, great product, but also uh, are trying to do something larger and really uh, make a difference uh, uh, and have a kind of uh, an idealistic co uh, component to the mission. So uh, I was involved with Mozilla uh, really from uh, very close to the beginning. Uh, and I continue to be involved as I've been involved all along with uh, Second Life, the online virtual world that has become a, a wonderful living laboratory of uh, personal self-expression uh, and of uh, uh, a collaboration that is still, I think, uh, on its way to having a kind of a, uh, a global impact. But today is not the Second Life talk. Today is uh, the internet and politics talk. So just a little bit of, uh, of history here to, to frame some, some context. Uh, really, 2004 uh, and the candidacy when Howard Dean was running for the Democratic nomination, that was really the proof of concept that the internet uh, mattered. If you went back, if you dialed back to the beginning of the 2004 campaign and you spoke to anybody who had been seriously involved in politics, they would uh, be completely dismissive of the importance of the internet. They would tell you it was all about television, it was all about knocking on doors, it was all about direct mail, uh, uh, but not the net. Uh, but what happened in the Dean uh, uh, campaign, and this was uh, uh, before it uh, imploded, uh, was uh, the heavy use of uh, meetups. Uh, in other words, people coming together online first in order to find each other to meet offline. Uh, and that became a very uh, uh, powerful uh, forum for uh, volunteers. And there was also the first serious fundraising uh, that was done over the internet by the Dean campaign. Um, of course, in the general election, Kerry versus Bush, uh, Kerry raised $82 million uh, online, which was really a staggeringly uh, large number by the standards of the day. And so the net of, uh, of, of 2004 was internet good for fundraising, and that's about as far, uh, as, far as it went. So if we look, uh, dial forward to 2008, um, internet fundraising 2.0, and this is for the Obama campaign, there were six and a half million instances of donation. So uh, many, some of which were made, the same person would donate uh, uh, multiple times. So six million of those were of $100 or less. Uh, and uh, in total, just from the online component, three million individuals raising more than $500 million. So these numbers uh, were unprecedented, unpredicted, uh, completely shocking, and have uh, enormous um, uh, implications. Now, and what was behind this, I should say, was a very sophisticated uh, operation uh, that had a large uh, email uh, component to it. And as the uh, database of potential supporters was, was gathered, a lot of effort was made to segment, to, to learn more about the people who were contributing and to classify them by 
where they were ge uh, geographically, but also in terms of age and, and gender, but also interests, professional interests or what affinity uh, a group they might be a member of. And they ran a very sophisticated uh, email marketing operation to slice and dice that uh, database and send targeted emails to different groups based on their characteristics, just the way you would if you were trying to sell a product. But this was in service of, uh, of donations. And the reason what they, uh, that so much money was able to be raised from so many people was, of course, in part the inherent appeal of the candidate. It's great to have a great product, but in this case, uh, the marketing and the techniques that were used were as sophisticated as anything anybody does. And one of the things they learned early on was that they did better by making multiple small asks. If someone has already given $100 and you know that, then you can come back to them in the face of a new event, a new opportunity, a new situation, a new need to raise money and say, can you give some more? And so all the giving was channeled through, um, you know, through the website, but uh, the, the email piece of it was uh, 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 really the secret weapon um, in, uh, in the fundraising. Um, another big piece of uh, the campaign was the online community, and that's really what I want to talk about and the way that functioned uh, uh, in the campaign. This is a screenshot from uh, my.barackobama.com, which was the online home for Obama supporters. It was seamlessly integrated into the, uh, into the website uh, itself, uh, but it was distinguished from it because the website as a whole had uh, you know, the biographies of, uh, uh, of, of, of the candidate and the position papers and, and, and all of that. Uh, and MIBO, as it's called for short, was really uh, uh, social networking software um, somewhat like uh, Facebook or any, uh, any other one with some key differences that I'll get to, but it was a place that people could uh, register themselves, create an individual profile, uh, join uh, groups, um, uh, find out where events were, uh, 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 create blogs, uh, and, and the like. And um, it was large. Uh, and enormously successful. So here are some of the, the stats on it. Two million individual profiles, two million people registered, 400,000 blog posts, uh, 35,000 local organizing groups were created, and over 200,000 uh, physical uh, events were, were sort of posted and you know, meetings were organized uh, around. It was uh, a major uh, major hub of, um, of activity and people, a place people came together. And it was the entry point for lots of people uh, into, uh, into the campaign. Uh, interestingly, um, the software that was used uh, to do that was um, not, uh, well, perhaps not what you think. It was a platform developed in a specialized way by a company called Blue State Digital. Uh, and that's a name I think you're going to hear more of. Blue State Digital was a consulting firm started by some veterans of the Howard Dean campaign right after the campaign uh, uh, wound itself down. And they started uh, taking on uh, consulting clients of other uh, candidates, but also labor unions and other kinds of progressive groups. And as part of what they did, they built um, a social networking platform that their clients uh, could, uh, could deploy. But the important point to note is they had four and a half years to work on it from the time the Dean campaign ended till we got into the general election cycle. And they put the platform through uh, multiple iterations and releases and added lots of capabilities to it. It wasn't something that was cooked up uh, at the last minute. And it had quite a, lot of, uh, quite a lot of capabilities. And that actually made a significant difference in the campaign. And what I want to focus on here in particular is something unique that it did, and it was the reason the Obama campaign and other candidates who used it um, uh, chose to use it. Uh, and this really, I think, is in terms of innovation, what people will be writing about going forward. There have only been a couple of things written about this so far. Uh, and during the campaign, people wanted to keep a low profile on this. But the big breakthrough was 
connecting the online and offline worlds together in the service of a political campaign for the first time. Uh, by which I mean that uh, in a conventional campaign, uh, a very important part is the field operation. At the end of the day, it's about knocking on doors, uh, talking uh, to your neighbors, uh, making phone calls, uh, and, 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 and getting out the vote. And traditionally, these field operations have, not, have been kingdoms unto themselves by people who are field organizers who would get paid, uh, paid canvassers and sometimes volunteers to go do the door knocking and the, and the phone calling. What happened in 08 for the first time was connecting the social network, the online piece, with the offline piece. And some of you may have seen it, but there was a way, if you were online and a volunteer, to move seamlessly into those voter contact activities. You could, for instance, sign up to make phone calls. Uh, and, and literally online, you could do them from your home, uh, uh, you would get uh, training. There's some video training. Um, and then a script of how to do a call. And then you would get assigned people to call, which you could then call. And then you would report back on, uh, on the results. And so the campaign was able to mobilize um, a lot of people in this fashion. I know that um, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of calls were, were made in this kind of way. And it was interesting and complicated from an information technology point of view how this worked, because it involved linking two completely disparate systems. You had the whole online social network with the people and their profiles and their interests and, and where they are. But how do you figure out who to call? Well, there's completely separate software called voter file software. And a voter file is just the database of, it starts out as a database of all, uh, all the registered uh, voters, which is assembled from the municipalities and states, and then has layered onto it lots of other stuff. Every time a campaign contacts um, a voter, uh, their record is, uh, is updated, whether it's sending an email or a direct contact. Uh, they also layer in demographic information they buy from other sources. Uh, and a lot of, um, you know, obviously all this stuff is geocoded, so you know exactly which neighborhoods you live. And there is uh, application software that the field operations use that runs against the voter files that do things like generate these call lists, like who is it worth calling? Well, we need to find people who are already supporters and make sure they get out to vote. Or we have identified some slice of people in some critical uh, district of a state who are undecided, and we need to try to get them to vote for our candidate. What they did in the Obama campaign for the first time was to tie together these two systems uh, so that from the social networking side, depending on who you were and where you were and what you've been doing, they would actually figure out who you should be calling. Uh, and there was an integration of this, the back-end voter file stuff with the, with, the, um, with, with the social networking software. I would say that watching this happen in 2008 was like watching what Howard Dean did with meetups and fundraising in 2004. This is proof of concept. It works. But it was kind of uh, first, uh, first generation. By 2012, it's, it's going to become mainstream for campaigns. Everybody is going to do this because it's an incredibly efficient way of gathering support uh, for candidacy. If you can get uh, people who self-identify and come online uh, to support a candidate, to move them into uh, more focused and more, more strategic uh, kinds of uh, activities. So I actually think this is political campaigns are going to change uh, dramatically in that a lot of the hard work is just going to be done uh, in, this, uh, in this online fashion. And I, I, I want to draw one more parallel to this. In the Web 1.0 era, when the first e-commerce websites went up, they work. You could go and say, this is 1996 or so, buy uh, a book from Amazon or you know, uh, a bid in an auction on eBay. But e-commerce has changed pretty dramatically in the past 10, 12 years. 
And one of the ways it's changed is the technology for watching what people do online, where they click, where they don't click, you know, when they abandon the shopping cart and when they don't, uh, what types of presentations people respond to better. So we'll put up this version of the site and that version of the site and see what happens. All the technology to do those web analytics has gotten to be very sophisticated and is a standard part of the kit. If you're now going to you know, uh, do e-commerce, you have to do that or you, you simply won't be competitive. I think what will happen is those same techniques are going to then migrate and be used in the political context uh, as to figure out, like, if, all right, let's do a calling campaign and let's use our online volunteers uh, to make phone calls to try to persuade undecided voters in the following areas. You want to be able to have an analytics package that tells you what's working and what's not on an instantaneous basis. Because if you do that, you can then change the campaign and say, oh, this is working better than that. So if you have that data, if you get the data on what's working and what isn't, you have a very rapid uh, a possibility of iterating your approach based on what you're learning day to day, which is one reason that commerce uh, over the web uh, has gotten to be so effective in many cases because you can move much more quickly to adapt uh, your product or service just because you have all of that data about what's working and what isn't, and this will, this will apply in politics uh, as well. And we're just at the dawn of that. Those systems haven't been built yet, but they're going to be built. So we're going to have the first uh, president of the internet uh, era. This is a shot. I don't know how well you can see it, but there, there he is uh, with his Blackberry. Uh, and um, historically, uh, President, sitting presidents do not use electronic mail, much less blackberries. There have been concerns about both confidentiality and security. But my understanding is a very serious effort is being made to adjust both the circumstances and the regulations so that uh, uh, the president can, can, can keep his blackberry and stay in touch with people, which seems perfectly reasonable uh, to me. So, what may happen going forward? Talk some about the campaign and, and IT. Um, this is a direct quote. Will we, we will keep the millions of people who played an integral role in the campaign engaged in the process. That's an Obama spokesperson in the last couple of weeks. So imagine in your mind, if you will, if the couple million people who had accounts on mybarackobama.com instead of just trying to get their candidate elected, worked on forwarding his agenda uh, by sending emails or making calls or, or calling on Congress in service of a legislative agenda, say, for health care reform or uh, uh, any issue that you might, uh, might choose to name. The power of that community in support of uh, a candidate or an elected official could be enormous. And there's now the technological means uh, for those communities to uh, influence uh, what happens, not just in the campaign, but uh, uh, in the course of a presidential administration. And that's the prospect that everybody is now wondering about. What is going to happen with the online Obama uh, community. So I can tell you I worked on the plan of what it could do in terms of sketching out the possibilities of how you might mobilize that type of community uh, to uh, influence legislation or to achieve other political ends. I did that all in the, in the pre-transition. I was part of a, a larger effort. At this point I have to tell you that since the transition started on this issue, I don't actually know what's going to happen. So uh, I assume that there will be some Obama for America part two or some new organization. Could be the Democratic Party. It might be a new organization. I, I don't really know. But that will become the successor to those uh, community uh, activities. So I would just, uh, I would be watching, watching carefully. Uh, 
because I think interesting things, uh, interesting things will happen. So we talked about campaigns, we've talked about advocacy. Let's talk a little bit about government itself. Um, the Obama campaign was, was and continues to be very clear about having some important strategic goals in this area of doing things differently, of opening up the government to its citizens. Uh, explicitly by using cutting edge technology to make what goes on more transparent, uh, uh, more accountable, and also to increase the opportunities for citizens to participate with their government instead of it being kind of a one-way from Washington outbound, more of a, of a two-way uh, kind, of, uh, uh, kind of exchange. Um, I mean, there's an enormous amount of uh, hard to access uh, governmental data that um, needs to be, and I think will be, made uh, available. Uh, and avail availability, I think, is a matter not just of there is some file somewhere you can download and it's three gigabytes and, you know, good luck. Uh, but uh, the Web 2.0 tools that will help people to uh, slice and dice and access, uh, you know, uh, uh, the data. Um, the the um, second thrust in terms of uh, information technology and government, besides openness and transparency, is really to use technology to make it more effective and more efficient. The actual operation of the government and the exchange between it uh, and uh, and its citizens. So. We've already seen um, a couple of early signs of change. Um, right after the election, uh, Obama's first address uh, was put up on YouTube, which had never, uh, never been done before. And something very interesting happened yesterday that I had a peripheral <coughs> role in. So this is a before and after of uh, screen grabs from change.gov. Change.gov is the official uh, website of the presidential uh, transition. And the top one uh, in, in the blue um, is uh, was at the bottom of all the pages, Contents Copyright 2008, All, all Rights Reserved. That changed, I think, on Sunday uh, to the bottom one, uh, which is uh, the copyright notice. It's a Creative Commons license that permits people very explicitly to share, remix, redistribute, and use the information uh, that is up on, uh, on the website. Um, there were, I would say, um, uh, discussions that happened between folks in the transition and folks at Creative Commons, like Larry Lessig and, and folks in the uh, Mozilla Foundation and, and other groups about, wouldn't it be great if um, you very, the transition very explicitly lived up to the ideal that it's setting by saying right here and now we're going to make the informa this information right here freely available. Um, and the videos which start out on YouTube, and nothing wrong with YouTube, but it's been observed that people who um, view things on YouTube are not granted the right by Google to record much less remix or redistribute those videos. Wouldn't it be good if the videos that the president-elect puts up were put up in a format uh, that didn't have those restrictions? So in other words, put it up on YouTube, but put it up in other places as well, and put it under a license that permits people to do the kinds of, uh, of, uh, of, of mashups and remixes and redistribution and embedding on the website that are part of the normal creative expression of your generation. Uh, and that's happening. So it's very encouraging, especially considering sometimes how slowly the government moves and how difficult it is to bring about change that um, they're beginning to put, you know, put their money where their mouth is, which is, which is great. Obama is also pledged to appoint the nation's first chief technology officer. 
uh, with that kind of mandate to increase openness and transparency and effectiveness and efficiency of, of government IT. Lots of challenges here. This is an issue I have been working on and I am continuing to work on. This office has never existed before, so it's a kind of a blank slate. It's like a Rorschach test. You know, what, what, is, what, is, you know, what does this mean? And federal IT projects are notorious for being late, over budget, and often don't work. So people have been trying to fix the computers at the IRS and the FAA uh, for decades, uh, Federal uh, Aviation uh, Administration. Um, the practices uh, that are used are, let us just say, different than the Silicon Valley startup. Um, so very typically, these kinds of large projects, as you may well know, are done on a kind of a cost plus contract, which means if you're the contractor that gets the award, you just bill for time and materials for whatever it takes to get the job done, and oh, you get maybe an 8% fee on top of that. So it creates, and, and there are actually good reasons why it was done that way. I don't mean to mock it, uh, but it's a well-known and well-understood problem that if you create the kinds of incentives that encourage the people who are working on it to take longer and spend more, they're probably going to do that. And so the challenges that a CTO is going to have are not merely technical. It's not like a CTO is going to come and say, oh, the future of computing is cloud computing, and all the services are going to be in the cloud, and it's going to be cheaper, and you'll save a lot of money. And and, and here's the plan for converting from whatever it is that you have today. Uh, oftentimes, the change that we need uh, is as much a matter of changing the procedures and the process as it is of, of changing the, the, the technology paradigm that's deployed. So I've been hoping that, well, look, there's no silver bullet on these kinds of issues, but the right kind of CTO could help bring about change uh, that would increase openness and uh, increase effectiveness and, and efficiency. But I have a few other ideas for the CTO, and I just want to share them today very quickly. Um, the, I, I say here, could, we could build a bridge between Silicon Valley and the Beltway. I, obviously, I do not mean a physical piece of infrastructure spanning 3,000 miles. Um, but metaphorically, the style of thinking, and I don't mean literally the Bay Area, I mean literally Silicon Valley, I mean the Bay Area and other centers of innovation where people are successfully creating uh, a lot of value by creating startups that meet unmet needs that are agile uh, and um, you know, uh, build, build effective businesses on that basis. That style of thinking and the style of thinking that you would find in a large federal bureaucracy of hundreds of thousands of, of, of people, let's just say they're quite different. And in, you know, oftentimes there's mutual disregard and disrespect. I would never go work for one of those people. That would be crazy. Or, you know, you startup people don't understand when you really have to secure the data, what you have to do, and you're, you know, and the kind of bridge building I think is that, that could be done is to bring people together in a way that increases understanding uh, and increases opportunities for engagement. I remember in the dawn of the internet era, I was involved with helping organize the first conference on computers, freedom, and privacy, 1990. It was the first time in one room there were people from law enforcement who were charged with making sure that bad things didn't happen with computer networks, we brought those folks together from FBI and Secret Service with uh, internet architects and ethical hackers uh, who were explorers and adventurers and were participating in, 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 in the early stages of commercialization of the internet. A lot of mutual suspicion between the groups, but there are great opportunities when you bring disparate people together and they find they have common kinds of interests and common vocabularies and actually have something uh, uh, to say and do with each other. Um, I think a CTO uh, could uh, inspire people uh, and put out a call to service for technical 
uh, professionals. I note that if you just drop one letter from Teach for America, you get Tech for America. And the idea that, that there might be a program by which recent graduates of, you know, with technical capabilities might go into a year or two of service uh, in a position to help make things better and improve uh, infrastructure and make a difference, I, I am going to try, I am trying to position myself with the folks in the transition in a way to give this kind of idea more, more, more credibility because I think there would be a lot of interest in that if those, uh, if those opportunities uh, ex existed. Uh, when John F. Kennedy was elected in 1960, famously he said, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. But he also created the Peace Corps. And the Peace Corps became a magnet then for people to go and do service who were not thinking about that uh, beforehand. And if we want to just take one more kind of uh, um, speculative flight uh, for another thing that could happen, uh, the New Deal, was Franklin Roosevelt, 1933, Great Depression, uh, the, had a Works Progress Administration, WPA. Uh, it employed millions of people, and they created an enormous amount of infrastructure, roads and bridges. Also, they operated uh, media and literacy projects. They did a fabulous series of guidebooks. They hired a lot of out-of-work writers and did a classic series of travel guides. Well, maybe as part of the Economic Recovery Act that we're going to need, that we ought to be thinking about a digital works progress administration that could create jobs that will help build digital infrastructure. Uh, my, my nomination for that is free municipal Wi-Fi, since the private sector can't seem to get it together to build uh, you know, uh, a, a tier of free service in every, uh, in every city. Uh, it could be done. It's not difficult. It wouldn't be that expensive, and it would put put people to work uh, for public benefit. What makes me optimistic about the prospects of the new administration is there really is an openness to using uh, IT in ways that um, make a difference. Uh, that's the theme in general. Uh, it is, it's both idealistic and pragmatic. And I think it poses a question you know, to all of us he says, what about you? And what, what, what he said in the campaign is, I'm asking you to believe, not just in my ability, this is Obama speaking, to bring about real change in Washington. I'm asking you to believe in yours. And I think that that's uh, still uh, a very, very, very uh, important uh, uh, sentiment. So to sum this up, um, the use of information technology in the campaign was really in service of an important set of values, of uh, inclusiveness, uh, of helping those less fortunate, uh, of removing barriers. Uh, this is what, uh, what the new administration uh, wants to do. And it's a challenge uh, to all of us to look at the ways that we live and work uh, and figure out how we can be in service to uh, these kinds of values. Um, as well. And to close, uh, I want to take, uh, I want to show you two and a half minutes of video of something that is uh, important uh, to me uh, in making um, a difference. And then we'll have some time uh, for questions. But I want to introduce the, I want to introduce the video here. It's just take me a sec to get this um, queued up. And then I'll explain what it is. have to move it on to the other. I know from long and bitter experience, trying to embed a video on a Mac when you're using PowerPoint doesn't work very well. And I did not have time to put all of this in Keynote. So I, I apologize for that. Um, one of the issues. Uh, near and dear to my heart, and actually uh, my wife, Frida Kapor Klein, is here in the front row, and to her also, is to ensure that everybody gets a chance to succeed and make the most of their talents. Uh, I was fortunate in the opportunities that I've had, um, and Cal, as a great public university, uh, has also been a place where uh, 
for a very long time, it, it, it has been uh, offered opportunities to people uh, to develop their, their potential. It's a great thing about a public university. I don't know if you know this, but I, I love to tweak my Ivy League friends. There are more students at Cal uh, from uh, families with uh, uh, lower income than there are at the entire Ivy League and Stanford combined. It's really a gateway where if you're smart and you want to make a difference, it is a great place to go to school. One of the things Frida and I do, and Frida is really the talent here, I'm just the, I, I help write the checks and, and the moral support for it, uh, is a, a program for underrepresented students of color here at Cal, Ideal Scholars Program. Um, time doesn't permit going into that. A second program that we run here is called SMASH, Summer Math and Science Honors Academy, um, which is for high school students from the Bay Area, uh, residential, on campus here during the summers. Kids live at Foothill, uh, and they're in the same uh, classrooms that you're in. This is an intensive, um, you know, 10 hours a day, six days a week, math and science focused college prep curriculum so that kids who have the potential to do well at a selective university can um, uh, actually uh, uh, get in uh, uh, and do well, so it, it, it helps them on their way. <clears throat> they do this, uh, they do, one of their classes is um, a, a tech or digital media class in which they, they make things. And in fact, Trevor Parham, who teaches that class, is here in the back. Put your hand up, Trevor. And I just want to show you what these kids did on their own without um, a lot of help or inspiration in terms of using the tools of today's information technology to uh, say something uh, uh, meaningful and, uh, and powerful. So these are three short student-created public service announcements made right here on campus. Thank you. We have time for a few questions. If there are any questions about anything, I'll, I'll repeat the question. Go ahead. Uh, in your considerable time in, in the tech industry and so on and so forth, what's been like the most surprising thing that you've seen come about uh, in, in the last? What's been the most surprising thing? Well, I, I expect to continue to be surprised. I, I believe that there will continue to be disruptive new innovations and platforms that at first appear completely marginal to virtually everybody except a few believers. Because that was my experience. The first personal computers weren't taken seriously by anyone. Um, and it's been true when streaming media started and when open source started. And the great thing is nobody knows what the next one is. It's really, there's no, there's no crystal ball. It, it, maybe it's robotics. Maybe it's something from the life sciences. And so I look forward, and it's y your generation who will be figuring that out. So really, I should turn around and say, I expect to be surprised by you. Yes, in the back. Uh, how do you see mobile playing a greater role in How do I see mobile playing a greater role? That's a great, um, in, in, in elections, that's a great point. You know, I, I think I'm still um, adjusting to the power of what you can do with these kinds of things. Um, so for me, it was just like an enormous uh, surprise when I realized, well, of course, if I'm somewhere and I want to find out where the nearest Pete's Coffee is, I just go to Google Maps and do search and put in Pete's, and it says three blocks this way and turn right. Now, it was probably obvious to you know, a lot of other people that the power of having this class of device is, is enormous. And I don't know exactly how people are going to use it, but I know that they're going to be important. And I know that when people are out doing field work and like walking around neighborhoods, they're going to be guided 
uh, they're not going to be carrying a sheet of paper. They're going to be getting instructions and talking to other people uh, you know, in, in real time. But we're, we're on the cusp of some very important things happening with mobile. You can see now there are 10,000 applications that have been developed for the iPhone and registered. You figure that there are two or three that are probably really good and really going to make a difference. And now it's the big hunt. Which two or three are those? Yes? Um, most companies like Google, um, they're for profit and they need to make money in order to um, stay alive. What techniques could the government use from Google in order to improve the FAA or the IRS <coughs> systems? That's an interesting question. What techniques could the government use from Google or other for-profit companies to improve the IRS or the, or the FAA? Um, well, if <laughs> a couple thoughts come to mind. The first is that, of course, um, a lot of what Google's proprietary software is built on an open source base. So the first question I'd literally be asking as a CTO in inventorying things uh, or the advice I'd give is, how much open source are we using? By the way, it's free, and that means that we can uh, take the dollars that we do have and build on top of that rather than being redundant and building over things. The second thing I'd, I'd ask is, are there available resources which already exist, maybe like you know Google Maps or the database behind that, that could be used as the basis for whatever geographical information system application we need to use. So getting out of the mindset that government is special, it has special requirements, sometimes it does, but not all of the time, and reusing uh, pieces of software and components and building blocks that have come of age in the internet, internet era could also potentially be a good, uh, you know, a good strategy. I'm not sure, on the other hand, whether the government should give all government employees 20% time to come up with interesting new ideas. That might be a bit too much of a stretch day one. Do I have time, I have time for one more? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, as in, as in, I'm going to take two more because I saw two hands go off. Yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, as an entrepreneur, yeah. what motivates you to, uh, to do service and like serve others? You know, the, the way I would put it is before I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a person. And there's something, I think, in me that just believes in giving back uh, and making a difference. And so I just bring that to my entrepreneurship and, and to everything else, not the other way around. Very last question. I know you have to go. Did you have your hand up in the gray Berkeley sweatshirt, blue letters? Young lady? No, I guess not. OK. I wanted to. All right, we, I see people. All right, you get the you get the last question. Okay. So I have a question about Mozilla Corporation. Um, there's a recent TechCrunch article about how Mozilla scale of money coming from Google Search for Firefox and threatening Mozilla's uh, non-profit status. What do you think is the logical step for the Mozilla to do more in this kind of situation? Is it better for the community to serve this better for the to just play into a for-profit for -profit corporation? Ah. What is it better to do? Okay. So. Uh, Firefox gets almost all of its money from Google through a commercial arrangement. 200 million people use a Firefox browser. It's a big audience. Uh, uh, there's a big contract with Google. Uh, does it threaten the nonprofit status? What should it do? That's a great question. The, um, I have to give a short answer to a complicated question. Uh, I think it's a very fruitful frontier of exploration to build hybrid organizations that combine the best of the business world with the best of the nonprofit world. And Mozilla, which makes Firefox, is a great example of that. The foundation uh, is the ultimate beneficiary of all of the money that comes in. And so I would argue if the money is used for purposes consistent with what it got its nonprofit status for, like if it's, the product is free and it helps make the internet safer and more open and so on, then the fact that there's a business base to it um, 
should be permissible. Uh, you know, hopefully the IRS sees it that way. Uh, it may take some time to sort out, but I believe otherwise you force nonprofits to be going around begging. And, and by the way, it's not, uh, Firefox doesn't have to be a stepchild of Google. There are plenty of other people who would love to, you know, monetize the search box and other parts of, of Firefox. Uh, Google to date has, uh, has given the best terms. But this is a really interesting area to figure out how you take what works well in business and tie it to an idealistic mission in a way that both uh, is uh, sustainable uh, and has integrity. And so that's your homework assignment. Go think about that very much. Thank you.